Hello everybody, this is Chris here. I'd like to welcome everyone back to my series which I'm calling Great Works of Literature. And we're going to start by looking at a new artist today. And as you can see by the images on the screen here, we're going to be talking about the author Robert Louis Stevenson. And today in this episode I'm going to give a little background and a little history and introduction to couple of the works of Robert Louis Stevenson that I am familiar with. So I thought it would be an appropriate time to take a little breather and a little break from Edgar Allan Poe, which we have looked at in great detail in terms of the short story The Cask of Amontillado over the past several episodes of this series. And today I thought it would be a good idea to introduce someone who I feel is also a great writer. And this writer happens to be instead of American he is actually Scottish he comes from Edinburgh Scotland and as you can see he was born in 1850 and he died in 1894 so he only lived 44 years and if you recall Poe was born in 1809 and died in 1849 so just before the year that Stevenson was born Poe died so they were not contemporaries of course but the point is that both of them did not live much past the age of 40, in Poe's case around 40, and in Stevenson's case around 44. So it's not unusual to see that in the old days, when we're talking about the 19th century, people tended to die at a much younger age than the current life expectancy today. So Poe actually had some kind of sickness and some kind of disease. How he died is still a mystery, as I mentioned. The exact cause of death for Edgar Allan Poe is still not exactly known, even today. But in Stevenson's case, we know how he died. And actually, Stevenson suffered from the disease tuberculosis throughout most of his life. And he traveled extensively around the world looking for relief in terms of his condition as tuberculosis. Um, but that's not what killed him in the end. In the end, he died of a cerebral hemorrhage at his home, and he was actually living in Samoa at the time. So on the left here, you see this sort of photograph of Robert Louis Stevenson as a younger man on the continent in Europe. And on the right-hand side, you see an older Robert Louis Stevenson on the island of Samoa, where he ended up living the last few years of his life on an estate that he built or had built out there on Samoa in a place called Appia, Samoa which is now part of American Samoa. So he has this estate out there on Appia in Samoa and it had about 300 acres and by the time he you know moved out to there in the South Pacific again looking for relief for his condition in the climate the environment of the South Pacific he was towards the tail end of his life obviously he didn't know it but he had made such a success of his writing career to that point that he had become a fairly wealthy man and he was getting a fairly steady you know income for those days 20,000 a year 20,000 pounds a year was a pretty hefty income for a writer in those days so he was self-sufficient and he had a great deal of luxury out there on the island of Samoa that he could purchase this 300 acre estate called Valima and he built his own house out there. So, of course, Robert Louis Stevenson is most well known for being the author of the renowned and celebrated book for children, and it is what's referred to books for kids. The two novels that he wrote that are primarily his most famous today are the novels Treasure Island and Kidnapped. And, of course, Treasure Island has become such an iconic sort of association with pirates nowadays of course you know the pirates of the Caribbean movies and Johnny Depp's character of Jack Sparrow and all of that adventure story related to um, the pirates of the Caribbean have sort of taken over the public consciousness of the association with pirates and pirate lore but the idea of buried treasure and you know Long John Silver and Black Dog and you know X marks the spot on the treasure map and all of this kind of thing really came into the public consciousness through the story Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson 
And that's a great story, of course, one of the great stories of adolescent or young juvenile literature, along with Kidnapped, of course, is a very high quality, very excellent story as well. So these stories made him famous, of course, Treasure Island and Kidnapped were his most successful uh, early novels. But then he, before he wrote, you know, these stories, Treasure Island and Kidnapped, he was more well known as a short story writer. And he helped to pioneer the modern short story, what we call the modern short story. And he wrote a great, great story early around 1882, which was called The Pavilion on the Links. And this is one of the great stories that Stevenson wrote, in his early days anyway. So this is how I became acquainted with Robert Louis Stevenson as an author. I used to go to the local library quite frequently in the course of my research for graduate school when I was uh, studying for, you know, <coughs> the courses that I was taking in graduate school. And I came across this volume of Stevenson's works, sort of this semi-anthology of, you know, it was not an entire collected works of Robert Louis Stevenson, but it was called The Body Snatcher and Other Stories by Robert Louis Stevenson. So I picked it up and I found this story called The Body Snatcher. And The Body Snatcher is a horror tale and it does have some supernatural elements to it but it is also a great short story. One of Stevenson's best in my opinion. So this story is actually a horror story somewhat in the vein of some of the tales that Edgar Allan Poe became famous for but as I said in the previous installment the style of writing is quite different of course. So, no one writes exactly like another author, but there are themes and there are images and there are motifs that can be consistent from author to author. In any case, this story is a horror story. So, I made it a tradition while I was in graduate school and further on down the road that every year on Halloween night, I would read the story, The Body Snatcher. And I made that into a tradition, maybe three, four, five years in a row couple days before Halloween, I would go to my local library. I would borrow this old text of the Body Snatcher and other stories by Robert Louis Stevenson. And I would read the Body Snatcher as a, a kind of Halloween story. And that became one of my you know, favorite traditions. So it was through that book and through reading the other stories in that collection that I became familiar with Robert Louis Stevenson. And then I explored other stories and other novels that he wrote. So eventually I picked up a collected edition of all Stevenson's short stories, and that's how I became familiar with this story called The Pavilion on the Links. And The Pavilion on the Links is also a great story. But again, these are early on in Stevenson's career. Where he really broke through was in 1883 with the writing of Treasure Island, and then a couple of years later with the publication of Kidnapped in 1885. But again, those tales, Treasure Island and Kidnapped, are generally thought of as tales for juvenile or adolescent readers. What he did publish in 1886, which is what one, you know, a lot of people feel is his greatest work, and certainly his most iconic work even today, is a short novel or novella called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And we'll start talking about that in a little bit more detail in a few moments. But just to go back to give you a little bit more history about Stevenson himself. He was a sick man, physically sick, with tuberculosis throughout his life. So as you can see, you know, he looks fairly healthy in this picture over here as a younger man. But by the time he's over there in Samoa, you can see how thin and how gaunt he is. And how sort of this disease has sort of ravaged him. And you look at his hand in particular down there, it looks very much, you know, withered. His arm is extremely thin, and, you know, his hands looks like it's kind of shrunken even. So this is the toll that the disease has taken on him in the in intervening years between these, this photograph here and this photograph here. But he always had a great mind, okay? So even though his physical condition was extremely weak throughout most of his life, his mind was always exceptionally sharp and active, and he had creative power and imagination off the charts. So what happened was that he actually had to leave Scotland uh, 
and he actually came to America and he came to San Francisco so how did that come about well he used to travel a lot as I said in search of better climates for his health and he did take a tour of France at one time in his early days and he used to write about it in the form of travel logs where he would go there's one book that is early in Stevenson's career the kind of travel log which is called travels with a donkey and there's another one called an inland voyage and on one of these trips in France he met a woman by the name of Fanny Osborne and she became his devoted love so he fell in love with her she was an older woman and she was married at the time but regardless of that fact he fell in love with her and then she went to America and was uh, getting a, in the process of getting a divorce from her husband in uh, San Francisco and Stevenson was back there in Scotland so somehow the story goes that she in the process of obtaining this divorce she sent for Robert Louis Stevenson in other words she asked him to come over to America and be with her so he basically dropped everything left it all standing got on a steamship for America now in those days you have to remember that you're talking about you know the 1880s here you're not talking about getting on the Concord and traveling from London to New York in three hours so we're talking about a steamship so right there from you know Glasgow or wherever he took off from Scotland to get to America New York City maybe you're talking about 10 days maybe at sea if you're lucky it could be longer of course I'm not really sure but it's not less than a week that's for sure so you got to take a steamship and now of course how are you going to get from New York to California well in those days obviously there was no airplanes as I just mentioned so the only way to get across America would be by train now fortunately for Stevenson the transcontinental railroad was completed in 1869 and had been in service for approximately 10 years by the time he got to America so what did he do he took a transcontinental railroad all the way out to California and of course that would take a long time maybe 10 days two weeks to make that journey 3,000 miles or so and the trip nearly killed him because again his frail health was already you know a physical drain on him and traveling in these you know third-class steerage cars on on the train and all this he really really suffered a great deal of physical um, pain and discomfort throughout the entire trip by the time he got to California he was almost dead but he did manage to survive and he did reunite with Fanny Osborne and they got married in San Francisco and then they took a honeymoon off into the Napa Valley which Stevenson wrote about in a story called the Silverado squatters I believe it was around 1882 and he then went to Scotland with his wife and stayed there for a year or two maybe several years and then eventually his health began to deteriorate and decline again so he traveled to New York and various other places but eventually he ended up on a steamship and made several journeys and several voyages in the South Pacific looking for a suitable climate to help relieve his tubercular condition so all throughout his life he suffered from this disease this tuberculosis and the South Seas proved to be an agreeable climate for him so he did a lot of traveling throughout the South Pacific and while he was in the South Pacific as I said he finally ended up on the island of Samoa and by the time he reached the island of Samoa and decided to settle there he had become su significantly successful with works such as Treasure Island kidnapped and of course the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde a huge bestseller when it was published so when he was out in Samoa he was building his house building his estate and then take a look at this portrait down here all right this is a portrait of Robert Louis Stevenson done by the great artist John Singer Sargent and this is a self-portrait now this portrait was not done in Samoa but again it gives you a likeness of what Stevenson's appearance was and as a matter of fact this portrait that I'm pointing out here was actually the portrait that was used for the cover of that novel uh, the, sorry the collected stories of 
Robert Louis Stevenson, The Body Snatcher and Other Stories, that I used to read every Halloween night for a successive you know, period of about five years. So John Singer Sargent, great American artist and you know, the premier portrait artist of his day, many people say, painted this portrait of Stevenson in England while he was uh, residing there. So by the time he got to Samoa, his whole life had changed. And here's a portrait, a uh, picture rather, of Stevenson and a group of his people who associated themselves with Stevenson. And if you take a close look at the picture, Stevenson is here, seated on the top step of this would be his home that's under construction there, Valima, as it is called. His wife here is Fanny Osborne. And I believe this is Stevenson's mother over here, okay, because she did go to Samoa after the death of her husband to join Stevenson. And he did have a couple of stepchildren from Fanny Osborne's previous marriage. One of them was a boy by the name of Lloyd Osborne. And Lloyd Osborne and Robert Louis Stevenson later worked together to write several stories. And he became uh, sort of an associate writer with Stevenson in his later days. So I believe this young boy down here is Lloyd Osborne in this particular photograph. And Fanny Osborne also had a daughter by the name of Isabella, I believe, and I think that's her over here. I believe that's her. And she married a person by the name of Joe Strong, if I'm not mistaken. And I believe this is a picture of Joe Strong right here. So the other people in the picture are natives, the ones seated down here on the steps and over here, this guy with the axe over here. Of course, they had to clear the land to build uh, Stevenson's house. And the native peoples really became friends with Stevenson. Or if you want to put it another way, Stevenson became a great friend and a great ally to the native peoples of Samoa. Of course, this was during the time of Victorian imperialism, of course. So the British presence in the South Pacific was well known in these days. And Stevenson, you know, would write stories with uh, this idea of British imperialism as part of the story. And one of his great late short stories, uh, written in the year 1892, a couple of years before he, uh, before he died, is called The Beach of Falesa. And that story, this kind of novella, has as one of its great themes some of the evils of British colonialism and imperialism built into the story. And it's one of the great stories of Stevenson's career, particularly one of the greatest in uh, his career in Samoa. So he was a great supporter and a great ally of the native peoples of Samoa. And he made friends, of course, you can see a large group of these native peoples are uh, entourage around his house. So that picture, I'm not sure what the year was, but obviously it was the time when his house was sort of in the final stages of completion. And then this house, Valima, actually exists today. And it has become a museum. So if I scroll down here a little bit further, this is what the finished house looks like. And you can see here on the front entrance, it says Villa Valima. This was Stevenson's house on the island of Samoa. So Stevenson was actually in the process of writing his uh, what he would refer to as his greatest masterpiece uh, called Weir of Hermiston when he passed away of a cerebral hemorrhage in the year 1894. And he was, again, a young man when he died, but he was able to extend his life uh, significantly by moving out to the South Pacific, and in particular this island of Samoa, because the climate was so agreeable to his health, it was helpful to him in the sense of extending his life far beyond what he would normally have expected if he had stayed in Europe. So this is what it looks like today, and it is the Robert Louis Stevenson Museum. So <coughs> Stevenson has had a great fascination for me ever since the time that I picked up that collection of short stories called The Body Snatcher and Other Stories. And, you know, I remember growing up as a kid, I was familiar with the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So if I think about the old days when I was a young kid, if I flip over here, take a look at this image here. All right. This actually, this cover right here, 
is the actual book cover for the edition of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that I had growing up as a kid. It was actually not mine. It was my older brother's copy. And I found it in his uh, bookshelf in his room. And I borrowed it and read it when I was a younger kid. So this story, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, became one of my favorite stories. And that also helped me to get introduced to Robert Louis Stevenson. And, of course, it is one of the most iconic uh, sort of characters in the history of English literature, of course. Everybody knows Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and what that story refers to. So, as I said, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was published around the year 1886, and it quickly became a huge bestseller. And one of the interesting things about the story of uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, maybe people have heard the story, of how it was created, but <coughs> Stevenson's inspiration for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde actually came as the result of a nightmare. Okay, apparently he woke up one night in the middle of the night after having this extremely vivid and uh, frightening nightmare, and this gave him the inspiration to write Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So over the course of the next few days, he actually penned the entire story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the course of like three or four days. And he was bedridden at the time. He was sick in bed when he was writing the story. So what he did was he wrote the whole thing out. You know, it's not a tremendously long novel, less, you know, 100 pages, if that. Uh, 80,000 words, I think, is the general estimate. But in any case, he wrote it 60, 80,000 words in approximately, you know, five days. So he was writing continuously during the time he was in bed because he had this freshness of this nightmare in his mind. So then the story goes that he showed it, the manuscript, to his wife, Fanny Osborne. And she made some critical remarks regarding the characterization of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So apparently in the original version, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde were two different people. So apparently, according to the story, Fanny Osborne suggested a different way of looking at that story. In other words, that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde could be incorporated into the same character. So Stevenson, hearing this criticism and commentary from his wife, he took his original manuscript, threw it in the fire, and destroyed it. Okay? And then he went back up to his room, and for the next three or four days, he rewrote the entire manuscript of The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde consecutively, you know, 18 hours a day type of thing over the course of the next three or four days and then that became the final version of The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So it's an amazing feat if you think about it. You know, 80,000 words or whatever in three or four days of continuous l writing and this was by hand of course. He always wrote everything out by hand. And then when it was published in 1886 it caught on like wildfire and really became a huge success. He had already obtained some kind of fame and some kind of celebrity for Kidnapped and Treasure Island, of course, but again, those were considered more stories for adolescents and juvenile readers. Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde became his most famous work for what we would call adult literature. And one of the reasons why I want to focus on the story is because I, I have a lot of you know experience with the story as well, but a lot of people would say that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is one of the great novels of all time. And I mentioned that it is on some of these lists of the 100 greatest novels of all time, which are put out by these book publishing companies and book publishing firms. So Robert Louis Stevenson is also um, known in his personal life as a great romantic. And this has some affinity to me. And I admire the fact, and I, I really... Um, do admire him as a person as well as a writer for making that journey okay because to be with the one that he chose as his lifetime partner in those days he took his life into his own hands because making that trip in that condition his physical condition as I said you know taking a steamship across the Atlantic Ocean there's no guarantee that you would have reached America anyway you know storms and whatever you know think about what happened to the Titanic in 1912 so there was no guarantee that he would make it to America anyway. And then to get from New York or wherever he landed to San Francisco, you're looking at another two, 
two and a half weeks on the Transcontinental Railroad, that trip almost killed him. But it didn't. And he made it out to California, and he married his love of his life, Fanny Osborne. So it's a great romantic story on, on the personal side. Now, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the story that we're going to look at first, is not a romantic tale. Okay, It is very dark, actually, in terms of its content. And as a matter of fact, there are practically no female characters at all or female uh, figures in the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde at all. All right, there was a movie and a story that came out, you know, several years ago, 10, 15 years ago, called Mary Riley, which was a fictional account of Dr. Jekyll's maid who experienced, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde's story through the eyes of the maid. That's a fictional work. That is not part of the original work. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the short novel called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Obviously, we're not going to read the whole thing. It's about 100 pages, approximately thereabouts. So we're just going to focus on the main important plot details, and we'll read some of the parts of the story, of course. But we'll talk more about the atmosphere, the mood, the theme, the characters, the conflict, and all of that in the story. All right, so there's a brief overview and introduction to Robert Louis Stevenson for you. I hope this was informative and interesting for you. If you would like to give me a like, please feel free to do so. If you want to share this video with a friend, please feel free. And if you would like to subscribe to my channel, I would really appreciate that. And I would be able to send you more videos as we go. So in the next installment, we'll get into the short novel called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That's about all for now. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you again very soon.